Meltzer is the New York Times bestselling author of eight books. And you all probably know that she recently came out with her latest bestseller, Demonic. In this book, she characterizes and details the peculiarities of liberals as standard groupthink behavior, or in other words, how liberals are mobs. And we are selling this book outside, and you should all pick up a copy if you haven't already, and we should help keep the best-selling streak alive. Anne is the legal correspondent for Human Events, and she also writes a popular syndicated column for the Universal Press Syndicate. She is a frequent guest on several national television programs, including The Today Show, Good Morning America, The Tonight Show, and of course, nearly all Fox News Channel shows. She has also been featured in publications like TV Guide, Harper's Bazaar, Elle, and Time Magazine. In addition to being an articulate and effective writer and speaker, Anne is also an exceptional legal thinker. After graduating with honors from Cornell University, she received her JD at the University of Michigan Law School, where she held the esteemed and much sought after position of editor of the Michigan Law Review. Upon graduation, she clerked for the Honorable Judge Bauman of the U.S. Court of Appeals, and she was an attorney in the DOJ Honors Program. And for those of you unfamiliar with the legal community, the Department of Justice Honors Program is one of the most prestigious programs in the entire legal world, offered only to a handful of the nation's top law school graduates each year. As one of the headliners of our Reagan 100 Lecture Series, Anne is among the most popular speakers that Young America's Foundation has the pleasure of working with, and she is also one of the most effective on campuses nationwide. Witty and fearless, Anne champions conservative principles in front of the most nasty and liberal crowds. Foundation Vice President Pat Coyle put it best when he told a crowd of students similar to yourselves that watching Ann Coulter tear a, prof a liberal professor's argument to pieces is something that you should all see in college. And it's true, you should all bring her to your campuses. It would be the campus event of the year. And trust me, liberals are gonna be ranting and raving about it for weeks, maybe even months. And so, in the words of Ann herself, you should all start thinking about holding bake sales in order to get her onto campus. And guys, we really did save the best for last this conference. Anne is, in my opinion, one of the most engaging and brilliant speakers you will hear from all week. Please join me in a warm welcome for Ann Coulter. talking about you on your campus for years. <laughs> um, thanks for coming out for this um, third day of celebrations of Obama's birthday. He's, I don't know if you've noticed, they've been going on all week. Um, he's one of three people in the world who celebrate a birthday week. There's Obama, there's Kim Jong-il, and there's my 10-year-old niece. All week. Everybody keeps saying it's his 50th birthday, but I thought during the campaign he said it was, he was 57. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. That was the number of states we have. <laughs> After watching all these ex extravagant celebrations, I'm thinking I could solve the debt problem. We're just going to tax, raise taxes on everybody who can afford to go to one of Obama's birthday parties. And now that he has this whole debt thing taken care of, um, he's going on a, a Midwest bus campaign tour. Uh, yeah, the White House says they're actually going to load the Greyhound buses onto Air Force One and then visit all the Midwestern cities he wants to see. But he's still playing the race card. He'll be sitting in the back of the bus. <laughs> Finally, I got some reaction from these people. <laughs> The uh, economy was supposed to be Obama's number one priority, other than shooting hoops. Um, but it's only gotten worse since he's become president. Um, last week, for the 17th consecutive week, over 400,000 Americans lost their jobs. Um, the lowest unemployment numbers since he's been president were the day he took office. <laughs> Most of the new jobs he's created so far uh, have been um, White House economic advisors. And uh, I hear they're hiring again. <laughs> uh, 
Last month, only 18,000 jobs were added to the economy. Most of those were, were at McDonald's. I have seen the future, my friends, and it's wearing a paper hat. <laughs> Um, I was really starting to panic about the economy, but then I remember two things. First of all, we now have a blue ribbon committee to take care of the budget crisis. And everybody knows in Washington committees solve everything, but this isn't just a committee, it's a blue ribbon committee. That's already created 10 new jobs in the blue ribbon committee industry. <laughs> And then I suddenly remembered that last year, Obama promised us high-speed rail. I'm sure that will be kicking in any second now. Uh, for the young people in the audience, you're all young people in the audience, well, I want to thank you all for paying my generation's debt. Um, I'll be paying too, but not as much as you are. Oh, you are paying and paying and paying. I meant to send a gift basket, but I've been traveling. <laughs> <laughs> According to uh, Obama's own Treasury Secretary, Timothy Geithner, within the next 10 years, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and paying interest on the national debt will consume 92 cents of every federal dollar. That's it, 92 cents. We'll have eight cents left over for national defense, congressional salaries, the Smithsonian, food inspections. Uh, <laughs> and what is the Democrats' plan on this? to lie, to lie and promise, oh, we won't touch your Social Security. Um, either that or they're not telling us and, you know, hey, who doesn't love a guessing game? <laughs> Every single thing Obama has done is precisely designed, targeted to wreck the economy. It's as if he, he carefully studied Ronald Reagan's presidency, rescuing us from the disaster of the Carter years, and then did exactly the opposite. And now they can't understand why the results are exactly the opposite. It's hard to believe, but in 2008, Obama presented himself as a moderate Democrat. And to be fair, in Kenya, he is a moderate. <laughs> he was, there was no drama Obama, just a young 14-year-old without a record he could be in. He could be nailed on. <laughs> and then he started socializing everything he could get his hands on. Um, first, he passed the trillion dollar stimulus bill that stimulated mostly the government. Uh, then he staged a government takeover of, of much of the auto industry and most of the banking industry. And then for the grand finale, socialized one sixth of the American economy with Obamacare, national health care bill. Since Obamacare has passed, a majority of Americans have continuously favored its repeal. So, so he did bring us all together. <laughs> Thank you, Obama. We all hate Obamacare. Uh, currently, about 60% of Americans want Obamacare repealed, um, and the remaining 40% say they, they support national health care provider that requires all Democrats to get their heads examined. <laughs> Obamacare was supposed to be the solution to problems created by the government <laughs> for years state and federal governments kept you know doing things for us helping us healthcare is too important to be left to a risky scheme like like capitalism the, the system that's given us designer eyeglasses in an hour or less uh jerry garcia shaped chia pets um every poor person has a cell phone a flat screen tv a microwave and a car no that system could not be trusted with something as important as your health care and so federal and state politicians started requiring that insurance companies would cover this or that medical procedure um, you know, restless leg syndrome, aromatherapy, prenatal counseling, anything that had a lobbying arm. <laughs> the whole idea of insurance is to insure against catastrophes. It's in case you're hit by a truck or your house burns down, a sudden marriage to a Kardashian daughter. It's for <laughs> catastrophes. Um, you buy insurance in case you develop some dread disease. Not, not so everyone can pay for your mole removal or therapy for gambling addiction. Uh, but as usual, the government solution, or the Democrat solution to problems created by government intervention in the first place was more government intervention. It's like trying to sober up by having another drink. <laughs> Except that's fun. <laughs> Obamacare and the Democrats keep telling us if only insurance is mandatory, the price will come down. It's like the guy has never ordered food from a hotel before. 
When you have no choice, does the price of an omelet go up or down? <laughs> so now our entire healthcare system is going to be run by the same people who run the Department of Motor Vehicles. You know, those incredibly long lines at the DMV. Now imagine you're standing in those same lines, but this time you're wearing a hospital gown that's open and back. That's Obamacare. <laughs> On immigration, the president's plan is, is basically find the states that are enforcing the immigration laws and sue them until they stop. I love this argument that we need a path to citizenship for illegal immigrants. A path to citizenship. We have a path to citizenship. It's called legal immigration. <laughs> Last month, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz said, Republicans are treating illegal immigration like it's a crime. <laughs> yes, you heard me right, my friends. The Republicans are trying to criminalize crime. <laughs> Wasserman is currently um, the ranking Democrat on the House Select Committee on the Painfully Obvious. Uh, speaking of brain-dead public figures, uh, congratulations are in order for the Obama administration for killing Osama bin Laden. Uh, of course, listening to the mainstream media, you'd think that President Obama parachuted in and killed bin Laden in hand-to-hand -hand combat. As I'm sure all of you know, it was thanks to enhanced interrogations at Guantanamo that we found the courier that was delivering information to bin Laden and tracked him to his compound. Maybe. Maybe if instead of enhanced interrogation we had tried torture, we could have found him in under 10 years. What, is this the anti-torture crowd? <laughs> uh, nothing much has changed at home. We still have to be sexually molested at the airports. <laughs> On the flight down here, I got the full pat down, but the TSA agent was really handsome, so I went through line again. <laughs> 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 so why were liberals hysterically chanting throughout the Bush administration, where's Osama, where's Osama, where's Osama? The death of Osama bin Laden no more ends the threat of Islamic terrorism than the death of Kenny Rogers would lead to the end of country music. <laughs> in fact, we could be in more danger now since bin Laden was killed. The Al-Qaeda terrorist network has threatened additional attacks, they say, are our tears of joy will turn to blood in that barbaric way they have of speaking. Um, so now they're ticked off at us? What were they before, just moody? <laughs> no, now they're mad. Uh, the biggest surprise in the attack on bin Laden's co compound was how active he's been in the Al-Qaeda network. Most people thought he was um, more of an inspirational figure with no actual role, much like uh, you know, Joe Biden with beard plugs. <laughs> but documents from the compound show he was involved in the day-to-day -day activities. Um, he had half a dozen wives, but only one of them was living at the compound with him. So one less than Arnold Schwarzenegger's been living, living with for the past 10 years. <laughs> really, can, can you blame him? <laughs> How often could he, could he take hearing, hey, Mr. World Terrorist, want to take out the garbage today? There were also about eight to nine children, his children, living in the compound with him. So we could have wrapped this whole thing up years ago if we just told Janet Reno. <laughs> okay, older crowds get that joke. <laughs> what, were you five when Waco was attacked? <laughs> uh, on foreign policy, Obama is utterly incoherent. Uh, liberals made fun of Sarah Palin for not being able to identify the Bush Doctrine, which didn't exist. Can anyone name the Obama Doctrine? He can't even name it. Though by watching his recent activities, I think it has something to do with golf. <laughs> uh, Obama's main foreign policy innovation has been to apologize on behalf of America um, to the Muslim world. In fact, Obama has recently broken Tiger Woods' record for most apologies by a mixed-race male. Oh. He, he, 
He apologized to Iran for President Eisenhower taking out crazed loon Mohammed Mossadegh before Mossadegh turned that country into a third world hellhole, you know, like the Ayatollahs have done. He apologized to the entire Muslim world for the French and British colonizing them, i.e. building them flush toilets. Uh, and you'll remember, he, I hope, you weren't that young, it was only a year ago, uh, he went on his famous 90 degree bowing tour of the Middle East and, and the Far East. Uh, for his next visit, he plans to roll on his back and have his belly scratched like Fido. <laughs> he's, he's ordered the mastermind of the 9-11 attack, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, tried in the same courthouse that tried Martha Stewart. How can this country even consider uh, trying that subhuman fiend in the same court where we tried Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? <laughs> We've lost our moral compass, that's all. <laughs> For purely politically correct reasons, he's in, in, increased troops. In, in Afghanistan because, oh, Afghanistan is ideal for regime change. They've got more goats than flush toilets. It's 70% illiterate. They have nothing we could possibly use in terms of natural resources. Consider that anything our bombs hit in Afghanistan costs less than the bombs. We can't even bomb them back to the Stone Age because they haven't entered it yet. <laughs> The only reason for Obama to, to in, have a surge of troops in, in Afghanistan was that it was a stupid democratic talking point against Bush. Remember, Iraq was the bad war, Afghanistan the good war. So on the campaign trail, he kept, kept thrilling his liberal base by saying, um, Afghanistan, that was the war of necessity, unlike Iraq, a war of convenience. Uh, and now Obama won't admit that his enthusiasm for war in Afghanistan with no point, no end in sight, is nothing but to make sure he doesn't look like an idiot. But I think that horse has left the barn. <laughs> Suddenly the war we, we were fighting in Afghanistan, sorry, we had won in Afghanistan. We won the war in Afghanistan in about three weeks. Now we're involved in another quagmire and unwinnable war. You will notice, close students of history, that we only seem to get involved in unwinnable wars when a Democrat is president. Interestingly, though, since national security has become Obama's problem, um, he's decided to keep Guantanamo open. I think he wants to keep it, keep it there in case Debbie Wasserman Schultz needs to be waterboarded. <laughs> so Obama isn't making any changes to Guantanamo, but he will denounce the same policies under George Bush pretty much like his position on gay marriage. Finally, for no national security reason whatsoever, Obama has decided to start bombing Libya. The French demanded we bomb Libya. And uh, admittedly, it was embarrassing to be out machoed by the French. <laughs> being, being, seeing the French be um, more macho than us is like being the second most virile member of the cast of Glee. Now this is embarrassing. <laughs> but that still doesn't explain what the United States' national security interest is in taking out Gaddafi. I mean, Bush already got everything we were going to get from Gaddafi when we invaded Iraq. You know, the war Democrats don't support. Gaddafi went whimpering to the British saying, is he going to attack us next? He is, gave up his weapons to mass destruction program, called in UN weapons inspectors, paid, um, I think it was $8 million to every family, admitted for the first time, admitted complicity in the bombing, the Lockerbie bombing, and paid $8 million to every family of anyone killed in the Lockerbie bombing. Why are we taking him out now? Uh, with the U.S. involved in, in various pointless wars around the globe, the economy tanking. I don't know why conservatives are always so upset when Obama's off playing golf. At least, at least that means he's not socializing another aspect of the American economy when he's playing golf. <laughs> if he directs any more of his brilliance to, to our economy, we'll all be on bread lines. So the bad news, we're still fighting in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya. Economies in the toilet, unemployment rate keeps going up with no end in sight. Home values are plummeting. 
But on the bright side, <laughs> Obama's handicap is down to a 16. <laughs> it's like he's trying to get his handicap below his approval ratings. Uh, I'll conclude in a minute, but I want to remind you with, that even with all of this going against Obama, and I do think he has a glass jaw, uh, he's still going to be tough to beat in the next presidential election. Um, he is an incumbent, and he's got the entire mainstream media on his side. When he ran in 2008, he had the mainstream media, the entire European Union, and Oprah on his side. That's a tough combo platter to beat. Um, yeah, in a poll in Germany shortly before the election, it showed that 80% of Germans supported Obama over McCain. And you know how great the Germans are at picking fantastic leaders. <laughs> Since Obama's become president, um, the media have gone from being the people's watchdogs to the government's guard dogs. That's with the exception of Chris Matthews, who has become the government's lap dog. And I don't know what kind of dog Rachel Maddow is, but anyway. <laughs> but, the, but the disadvantage is he's going to have to run on his record this time. When Ronald Reagan ran for a second term on his record, he won the largest electoral landslide in US history. There was, I'm sure you didn't see this, but you should try to find it on YouTube. There was a Saturday Night Live sketch shortly before that 1984 election and had Mondale in his war room and, you know, there were the various districts on the map, but the entire map was nothing but a map of Minnesota, <laughs> the only state Mondale took. <laughs> and by the way, because he was so gracious, um, Ronald Reagan almost had a last minute campaign trip to Minnesota in 1984, and he said, let's let him take his own state. <laughs> and it was close. It was one of the closest elections in history, even in Mondale's own Minnesota. Um, now Obama's complaining, explaining his record by blaming it on, on Bush. Um, he says he had no idea how bad it was. Wasn't he in the Senate for two years before he became president? Maybe if he showed up for work, he would have known. <laughs> Yesterday, he said, Obama said, um, yeah, I promised change, but I didn't promise change overnight. Well, my friends, I will promise you change overnight, and that night will be November 6, 2012. Thank you. You've been a great audience, and I'll take your questions. Year where it's I've been there. That's yeah. quite a university. <laughs> Extremely leftist. So basically, I get into a lot of heated debates with liberals about illegal immigration. I'm from Southern California, you know, like hour and a half from the border, not Boulder. <laughs> and so we get into these heated debates, and basically, I'm always stumped to the point when we talk about in terms of jobs. So they say their argument is that no one who's actually an actual citizen is going to want to take the jobs that the illegals are taking, like you know, bus boys, right. garbage workers. And it makes a little bit of sense to me, and I don't really know how to counter that argument because it kind of makes sense to me. I think there are a couple arguments about that. I, I hear that argument from small business owners, um, restaurant owners, for example, who love the illegal alien wages. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they say, oh, no, white kids won't, won't do this job, young suburban kids. You own the hottest restaurant in Aspen. You can't get a kid to come work there. Exactly. No, I mean, once you start, once something becomes um, a place where only illegal aliens are working, well, then you're not going to get college kids wanting to work there. They're all speaking in Spanish. We don't understand. So actually, I don't believe that. I think it's something that feeds on itself is one point. And the second point is, how about American ingenuity, ingenuity and invention? I, I think we need fewer people doing lots of jobs. Where, 
I mean, we don't have major innovations anymore, other than in the computer industry, as far away from Washington and Washington government controls as possible. Where are our flying cars? Where is the cure for cancer? Where are the machines that pick the fruit themselves and self-sweeping sidewalks? That's what America is famous for, but we've stopped doing that so we can employ the entire third world. Thank you. Hello, Anne. I met you two years ago at the same conference, by the way. Um, nice to see you again. Um, I'm Courtney from Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, my, uh, this is actually a two-parter question. And the first question is probably wondering by 99% of the whole people here, are you running next year for the presidency? And if not, <laughs> why not? And, Why, thank you. And then but... part two is, are you taking interns for what you do? Am I taking what? Interns. Oh, interns? Yeah. Yeah, if any of you are really good at computers, I have a few computer things I want to work out. But I am so looking for a computer jock right now, so I'm glad you asked that. Um, Apparently, the younger you go, the better they know computers. Um, no, I will not be running for president. I apparently lack uh, something politicians need, diplomacy. <laughs> and there were two times when, when Bush was president, and I realized I could never be a politician. Once was, you know, right after 9-11 and, and, and subsequently when he's always going around talking about Islam or religion of peace. It's a religion of peace. And as you know, I use the phrase frequently too, but only sarcastically. And I understand why Bush had to say that. We do have Muslim allies. We're not going to take on the whole Islamic world. Um, there haven't been that many homegrown attacks. Um, but I don't think I could say it without dripping with sarcasm. And the second time was when they hung Bill Clinton's portrait at the White House and Bush had to say nice things about Clinton. No, I could not do that. <laughs> well, thank and you. just as a rule of thumb, I, I don't think you can run someone for president who hasn't run for office, who hasn't held elective office. I think it's got to be a governor or a senator, um, just to save you all a lot of time and heartbreak that I have been through myself. <laughs> you can't run from the House as much as I love Michelle Bachman and Thaddeus McCotter. Um, you can't run without holding an elective office as much as I love Herman Cain. Um, and this is coming from someone who has supported in the past for President Pat Buchanan, Steve Forbes, Alan Keyes, oh, and Duncan Hunter. At some point, you learn your lesson. Preferably a governor, probably a senator, but right now, it's going to be Romney unless Chris Christie jumps in. I say, and yeah, frankly, all of them are better than John McCain. It's not that bad. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Grant from the Young Britons Foundation. Uh, I was just thinking during your speech, what's the hardest question I could ask you? What is your favorite Obama policy? <laughs> oh, I can name several, but they're all continuing the Bush policies, continuing the Bush tax cuts, keeping Guantanamo open. Um, what about oh, I support his position on gay marriage. We're both against it. <laughs> what if you could repeal one bill? If I could... One Obama bill. Obamacare. Okay. <laughs> I think all of America is dying to repeal Obamacare. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. And with that accent, you should, be, you should hope we repeal Obamacare if you want to get good health care someplace in the world. <laughs> Hey, how's it going there? My name's Chase Salazar, and I go to the University of Oregon. <laughs> go Ducks! <laughs> wow, um, Oregon has a strong presence here tonight. <laughs> uh, Who knew? I'm, I'm actually uh, going to be an incoming freshman, and uh, I'm going into uh, biochemistry. And I'd like to pursue a course into pre-med, and obviously I have some concerns about, about Obamacare. Right. If it does get, come into effect and there isn't a repeal, what what catastrophe do you think might happen? Well, I don't want to tell you this because I would like smart kids to keep becoming doctors, but I don't think it'll happen. You know, Democrats are always um, complaining about how much doctors get paid. You know, after spending, graduating at the top of their class, working constantly through college, going to law school, spending 10 years in internships where you will never go out and see your friends, by the way. Oh, no, they're paid too much. No, doctors are paid the least well of any profession in America. How about comparing a doctor to screw off John Edwards who just 
comes in and, oh, I'll take 300 million. What, what is he, how has he made society better? They just try lawyers come in and wreck everything. Um, but of course, we couldn't include tort reform with, with Obamacare. If it's not repealed, and I think it will be repealed, becoming a doctor will be like becoming a postman. And I don't mean to dis postman, but I think most people look at a, a doctor, I certainly did, my roommate was, was a pre-med and is a surgeon now, and when I was, you know, dancing on tables and drinking in bars, she was in the chem lab <laughs> every Friday and Saturday night. And the idea that she, she doesn't have John Edwards' wealth and John Edwards has it, I mean, it shows you there's something wrong with this system. But the reason American doctors are paid, um, although I think they're paid way too little, are paid less than European doctors is it's not that impressive a job in Europe. It's like being a postman. You're working for the government. And um, do you think that the rates of kids going into medical school will drop significantly? Oh, because yes. The pay decreases? And, and that it won't be as hard to get in. It won't be our top students as it is now. It's a very, very bad thing. We've got to repeal Obamacare. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thank you. And I hope you become very wealthy as a doctor. Hi, I'm Christine Yourcell. I go to Providence College. Um, I saw your clip from the uh, Father Albert show like a few weeks ago. Oh, I was wondering yeah. if anybody saw that. And pretty much the entire audience and possibly the host wanted to kill you at some point. Yeah. Um, how do you maintain your composure and do you have any advice for like students like me when in a similar situation in a classroom? when everyone hates me. <laughs> oh, that I take with relish. <laughs> Enjoy it. Um, you know, it's funny because I was making a conscious decision in that case, and sometimes I do, um, because they were, I, I don't know if any of you saw this, it was all um, some of the stupidest people you've ever seen, all single mothers. I mean, it was like I was sitting with an audience of Jerry Springers um, standing up haranguing me and, and man, were they stupid. Um, and I could have been meaner, but I just thought, you know, for viewers at home, sometimes it's better if you just absorb the attacks because if you, if you get them back, well, then people aren't, who may not already be on your side, aren't necessarily on your side. But I did walk out thinking, oh, screw it. I wish I had attacks back. Um, Though I've gotten a lot of emails since then from people very sympathetic, so maybe it works. But I mean, I suppose, I suppose I'd say, at least in my case and probably many of your cases, we're Christians, we love to be attacked. <laughs> Christ warned us, and when the world hates you, remember it hated me first. And it will happen, and I have noticed that, that it is on the moral issues you will be attacked more viciously than anything else. It was a debate about single motherhood. I could have been talking about um, tax rates. Wouldn't get a tax like that. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Courtney O'Brien from Allegheny College in Pennsylvania. And I was going to ask a more serious question, but I realized I want to know the answer to this one instead. <laughs> um, I know there's lots of liberals in Hollywood that really should not be talking about politics. I know irritate me, and I'm sure a lot of other people. And I was just wondering if there's one liberal in particular that irritates you the most and that you most enjoy like criticizing. Well, I was brokenhearted when Keith Oberman was fired. <laughs> that, I'm still recovering from that. He's dead to me now. You know, he's on some podcast. I'm not going to attack him now. It's like, a, it's like attacking your next door neighbor. And then he said, <laughs> um, so he was, among, I mean, he's far from Hollywood. <laughs> um, Liberals, I like it. And yes, and also it was heartbreaking when Teddy, Teddy Kennedy died. I think enough time has passed that I can bring him back. Um, very, very sorry. I was just telling them when we were coming over to this speech, you know, I was writing my speech this work, week thinking, I am so, so morose that Anthony Weiner is gone and the debt ceiling is the topic of the current news. Really, all I wanted to do was talk about Anthony Weiner. <laughs> but I thought that would seem a little stale. Alas, please come back, Anthony Weiner. Um, and Hollywood people, no, I, I do enjoy having them talk. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, 
um, my name is Claire, and I go to the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And wow, that's like Boulder. <laughs> yeah. um, I was actually wondering if you could maybe touch on the um, group think mentality of the union protests in Wisconsin and Ohio this year. Um, you know, I, I, the, when I wrote this book, once I figured out liberals and their mob characteristics, I couldn't stop writing. And I ended up actually cutting about half the book. And originally, I had a chapter on the public sector unions. Um, <laughs> And I mean, if I could just say, it's just madness to have a government union. You need a union when there's management on the other side. If you don't have a boss on the other side of the bargaining table saying, I want you to work longer for less money, you don't need a union. And you have exactly the opposite of that when it comes to government employees. Uh, because the Democrats have this, this parasitic relationship with them where the Democrats will get ever more fabulous pensions and health care benefits and retirements and work rules um, for people who work for the government. And in return, the government unions make sure the Democrats get reelected. But it, it, the Democrats aren't spending their money. The government isn't turning a profit. As we know, they're all losing money. Um, the taxpayers are paying for it, which is why FDR and George Meany said there, there should never be a union for government employment. But that really, I think, is the big division now, and, and no, you, I mean, you see all of the mob techniques, the slogans, the chanting, um, and, and not only the psychological mob techniques, but branching out into actual dangerous mobs, mm -hmm. um, including, I have a section in my book um, on the attacks on people's private individuals' homes. You can never, ever imagine a conservative doing that. Frankly, you can never imagine a conservative coming up with a slogan. We keep trying to. <laughs> Um, we're just not good at slogans. <laughs> it's not our thing. We want to stand with, you know, a chart and a pointer and use logic and facts. That's what conservatives do. One of my friends told me after the, uh, the 2000 election, um, when you were all five, um, and, uh, you know, Gore tried to steal it. You've probably read about that in the history books. Oh, no, you haven't. You went to public schools. Gore tried to steal the election, and so conservatives were staging protests. Anyway, she goes to one of these protests, and we're, she used to be on the left, and <laughs> all she could talk about was how pathetic the conservatives were at protesting, and they all go out with their little handmade signs, and there's a guy with a bullhorn, but he doesn't get the idea of a chant and how a chant is supposed to be <laughs> responded to. So he'd be saying into the bullhorn, we oppose the recount because it violates the Constitution, and we are not. And he's going on and on, and everybody's waiting to hear what they're supposed to chant back to. We just can't do it. <laughs> but they take to it like fish to water. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Lucia, and I'm from Cornell University. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> That's a fine school. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, my question is about campus activism. Um, I'm the news editor at the Cornell Review, and there's this kind of ongoing debate among different conservatives as to how we should approach being active on campus. You know, should we be really radical? I know there are some Review alums who used to compete to see how many death threats they could get. Yes. Um, <laughs> or if we should be kind of you know moderate and just present our arguments, but do it in a more subdued way so we can appeal to middle um, middle thing. No, I think if you want to be subdued or moderate, you should join a more appropriate club like <laughs> the Libertarian Party or the Glee Club. <laughs> no, we are conservatives. <laughs> Go out with arms blazing. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you. John Tuareg, Canisius College. Um, I had a question about your involvement with the Paula Jones case against Bill Clinton. Oh, thank you for asking. A and, blast uh, from the past. So you were an uh, unpaid legal advisor to her case against Bill Clinton. And um, I believe Just, after she went and modeled in penthouse and posed nude for pictures, because she had went on Larry King right. and attempted to defend that, saying you never asked her to help. You never wanted to write a book with her so she could make money and get rich off the case. and. Um, I guess after Bill Clinton's defense team had said to her, or had said about her, drag a hundred dollar bill through a trailer park and right. never know what turns up. Um, my question was, do you regret your involvement with that case, or do you think it? Oh helped? no, we got Clinton impeached. Just the tri impeach crowning Clinton? triumph of my life. <laughs> <laughs> No, and she, I mean, uh, liberals are such, 
phonies and hypocrites. Here was a genuinely powerless woman who, who was, forget the phrase sexual harassment. Liberals consider it sexual harassment if you call your secretary honey. No, what Bill Clinton did would have been illegal in this country in 1492. He dropped his pants and in a smooth Cary Grant line said, kiss it, to some <laughs> low level, <laughs> utterly powerless employee, and she bravely stepped forward, and I thought she was really quite inspirational, and uh, um, I helped her with her, her, some of the legal arguments. That was mostly the elves. She had an enormous amount of expensive <laughs> legal talent working on those briefs. Oh, and by the way, when um, no lawyer could afford professionally to take that case publicly, and so these two guys, and God bless them, they took the case. Um, I didn't call them this. The other lawyers referred to them as the yokels. They were in Virginia. And like I say, God bless them, they took it. But you know, they were on TV talking about the case. And then the brief is submitted. And it was actually written mostly by two or three lawyers, all Harvard, Yale law grads. Um, I guess two of them did it. Uh, and we all went to the Supreme Court argument that day. And as we were walking out in the hallway, uh, the press is walking out. We hear them all saying, those guys didn't write that brief. It was very clear that she had impressive legal talent, and it makes a big difference in Supreme Court cases. Um, no, she deserved a defense. And we deserve to redeem the legal principle that we don't have a king. And the president can be held to account for, for his criminal acts, um, which is what we got in a 9-0 ruling in her case. I think she was completely telling the truth. What disappointed me bitterly and horribly um, was that, and this is how the left operates, they just want to tear you down and besmirch the morals of this perhaps not very bright but perfectly moral girl, and they did get her to appear in Penthouse. And it broke my heart when she did that because she was absolutely sterling until then. Okay, it's done, it's over. I'm sure she's a lovely girl again. But Thank never you. fall for it, conservatives. They're just trying to bring you down and turn you into an animal like they are. Thank you. I am John Thomas Justice, and I am homeschooled. Uh, you said that your ideal presidential candidate is Chris Christie. Yes. And <laughs> now he's he's a tremendous governor, and he's doing great things for New Jersey. But uh, I think there are two things. One, I don't think he'll run because, first of all, New Jersey really needs him. They still need him. Well, that's the main complaint I've heard. I spoke in, uh, where were we, Philadelphia last week, and people were coming up from New Jersey saying, I must oppose you on supporting Chris Christie. I'm from New Jersey, and he's cut my property taxes. We can't lose him. <laughs> so that's the main complaint I hear. <laughs> but the, point two, you have. And, and the second one, uh, I'm kind of like with Sean Hannity on this one. He, uh, there, he's not exactly across the board conservative, particularly on, on social issues. That is a lie. That is an absolute lie. They think he's Rudy Giuliani. He is Rudy Giuliani without the problems. Everything we loved <laughs> about Rudy Giuliani. For one thing, is the New York Times, and I linked to this some time ago, it was like three months ago, even the New York Times, <laughs> not, not admiringly, pointed out that he is the most socially conservative governor New Jersey has ever had. Mm. He is ferociously pro-life. I spoke to the New Jersey pro-life group in January and wanted to see what they'd have to say about it. He had already spoken to them. No, I see. He's in New Jersey. And, he, and by the way, I think being pro-life is a very good litmus test for all the other issues. And just to quickly contrast with another possible presidential nominee, though I kind of think it's, as I said, it's going to be Romney unless Christie jumps in. And that's Rick Perry. Look, I like Rick Perry, but it's different when you're running in Texas. Texas is a great state. Texas won't. <laughs> but Texas voters won't let you get away with being a moderate Republican, right? I oh, mean, true. John McCain's voting record wasn't bad. How would John McCain or Rick Perry have voted if they were in New Jersey? They probably, well, at least with McCain, I think Perry's better than, than McCain. <laughs> I, think, I think Obama's better than McCain. Um, um, <laughs> McCain would have been John Corzine if he were running for office in New Jersey. Right. So you have to grade them on a curve, and and I've, 
I don't believe that everything that I keep hearing about Corzine being, quote, socially liberal, it never pans out. And by the way, the one who's starring this rumor is Mark Levin. I keep emailing, I love him. Um, I love him probably more than any other public figure, but he is wrong <laughs> on this. And I've been emailing with him about it, and I keep saying to him, well, okay, then who do you support? And he emails back, I hate all of them. Well, that's not an option. <laughs> Come on. It's Romney or Christie, and, and Christie, I, I, I've never seen, I haven't seen a politician like this since Ronald Reagan. Well, I mean, now I'm, I'm, saying, I'm not saying that Christie wouldn't be a great candidate or be a great nominee. I'm just saying what objections have from other parts of the uh, conservative camp. My thing is, if Christie does not run, who would be you know, your second choice? Well, I tend to think it doesn't matter because it will be Romney. <laughs> But I think he uh, would no. probably be my second choice. If I could just appoint somebody, I'd appoint myself. <laughs> I just don't want to go through the running part. But man, would I be good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Lindsay Ann Gumsey, Truman State University. So I heard you speak at CPAC, and you briefly mentioned something, um, your opinions on law school, and we just heard, yes. <laughs> yeah, we just had the first, uh, one of our earlier students mention about med school and your, you voice your opinions on that. I was wondering if you could voice your opinions again to everyone here about law school. I'm so glad you <laughs> asked because I haven't had an opportunity yet to tell you all not to go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go to law school. You'll wreck your life. You'll be poorer than all your friends. Uh, they you'll end up with enormous student debt, and it's all based on billable hours. You'll work weekends for the rest of your life as all your friends are making more money and taking weekends off. And the only way to get around that is to be a completely immoral scumbag trial lawyer. And if you're that, then you are so at the wrong meeting right now. <laughs> you should be with the, at the Democrats meeting. Don't go to law school. Tell your liberal friends to go to law school and they'll ruin their lives. I, to quote liberals on Iraq, what does victory look like? In Afghanistan, it's a joke. The, I, I mean, the big liberal argument on Afghanistan being the good war and Iraq the bad war was Iraq didn't hit us on 9-11, Iraq didn't hit us on 9-11. Well, Afghanistan didn't hit us on 9-11. It was, it was Osama bin Laden that had come in and he was allowed to set up shop by the Taliban. As is well acknowledged, the Taliban didn't care about Mullah Omar had no idea what was coming and was certainly not enthusiastic about attacking the United States. They invited Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda in in order to go against the Northern Alliance. I mean, if you look at the history of Afghanistan for 200 years, they've never been the invaded. Or, or the invaders, they are the invaded, and they apparently don't like foreign troops on their soil. They don't <laughs> like it a lot. They're perfectly happy to be illiterate, toothless, have a 30-year lifespan, just no foreign troops, please. Fine, accommodate them. What are we gonna do there? Iraq and Afghanistan, by contrast, are fantastic countries for regime change. I would have been perfectly happy if we had invaded Iran as well as Iraq. Um, <laughs> Because they're both highly literate, pro-Western, young populations who happen, that happen to be led by crazy people. So you take out the crazy leaders and you have fantastic countries. What we've needed and what we got in Iraq, I might add, is an Arab Israel. That's what we needed. And, and as these various skirmish, skirmishes happen around the world, um, okay, again, you were five years old, but um, there were some Danish cartoons of Muhammad <laughs> when you were five. Uh, and Muslims across the globe, you know, responded in that religion of peace way of theirs by bombing embassy, murdering nuns, setting things on fire. Um, one place where Muslims did not behave that way, yes, Iraq. Thank you, George Bush. No, Iraq is a fantastic war. Afghanistan, we had finished in the first three weeks. Take out the Taliban, quarantine the country. 
Afghanistan and Indonesia are about the only two Muslim countries that have no interest in invading anyone else. They want to herd their goats. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Stephanie Wang. I go to the University of Michigan. And <laughs> um, I just want to know what you thought of GoProud being dropped from CSPAC as a sponsor. Well, I told them, I'm, I'm friends with them. Oh, here's something else you can do for me in addition to producing some young computer jock to help me with my web page or some changes I'd like to make. I'm, I'm also going to be on GoProud's board, but I told them I wanted to come up with a really zippy title. <laughs> so I was thinking Vice Rear Admiral. <laughs> or <laughs> Grand Ayatollah. But I don't have it yet, and until I think of what my title is, I can't be on, on their board. I mean, I, I, I understand both sides on this. Um, I mean, most, if, if you're actually born gay, of course you're a conservative, because you're, you're not you know, acting out some neurotic obsession you have with your father. Those are the angry gays. I don't even believe they were born gay. They're the liberal gays. If you're just born gay and you can be any political party, why wouldn't you be a right winger? We're the ones who want to lower your taxes, protect you from crime, oh, and protect you from the Muslims. The punishment for homosexuality um, in the Muslim world is that you have a wall dropped on you. <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh, but I just love these punishments. <laughs> They're so creative. Um, <laughs> Okay, that's our party. So there are a lot of gay conservatives, and I like them. And then the conservative position is, and I understand their objection, yeah, okay, we know they're gay conservatives, but we shouldn't have a group based on what is technically a sin. We don't have, you know, conservatives for premarital sex. <laughs> so I told the Go Proud guys after they were banned from CPAC, first of all, don't take it personally, I was banned from CPAC. <laughs> So all the cool kids get banned once in a while um, for a really good joke, too. Um, and I said, look, just attend as individuals and throw your party off site. And by the way, the year I was banned from CPAC, God bless you, Yaf. They had me speak, and it was a huge hit. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Ann. My name is Joe Shaver. I'm an intern at Human Events. Oh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> I work, that's my home newspaper, Human Events. What advice do you have for young conservative journalists? Um, what advice do I have? You know, I'm always thinking of ideas that I think somebody needs to look up and do, and I just don't have time to look it all up. Um, so I was going to give you specific writing assignments, but I can't think of them right now. Um, I guess just see what, what annoys liberals and do it over and over again. <laughs> That's when you know you have struck gold when the spittle starts to fly from their mouths. So don't be intimidated by that. Be encouraged. Okay, thanks. Hi, Anne. My name is Josh Peterson. I graduated from Hillsdale College. Oh, that's with, great. Thank you. Um, I was with the National Journalism Center this summer. Also and, great. So and, was I and Greg Gutfeld, and, two illustrious graduates from that school. <laughs> and uh, I am also a uh, computer jock. So. Excellent. Thank but, you. Uh, I'll my, talk to you after the, right. after the event. Uh, my question is, uh, we've heard a lot this weekend also about conservatives influencing culture. and. Um, how, how do conservatives create compelling art uh, and take that to Hollywood or take that to uh, New York or take that to the music industry? And how, how, is, how do they create a, uh, compelling art that's also convicting? Oh, that's a great question and is a follow-up to the don't go to law school point I was making before. I forgot to tell you what you should do. And I am the grand Ayatollah, so you must hang on my every word. You must go into the media, go to Hollywood, or become a public school teacher. I know I'm always making fun of public school teachers, but we have to take over their temples the way they take over ours. Um, and just go out there. <laughs> whatever, your, whatever your talent is, and, and um, I spend a lot of time in LA, there are a shocking number of right-wingers in LA. They just keep their yap zipped. Mm -hmm. And I will say, contrary to my advice to young 
um, college activists in, in that case in Hollywood. Don't let them know what you think. <laughs> do, do keep a low profile. I mean, it's really, it's really serious out there. There were people who helped me with my book I couldn't thank. I'm the only author who has to ask people if I can thank most people, you know, oh, it's a happy surprise. Oh, she thanked me in her book. Um, no, I have to check with people to make sure I'm not ruining anyone's career. And, and there were a fair number in the entertainment industry and not small people um, who would help me, and, I, and they told me, you know, I don't really care for me, but you know, my kids go to school out here. <laughs> I can't do it to them. Um, so no, in Hollywood, keep your mouth shut, but I, and how to make compelling art, I mean, I think you know this better than I do, but compelling art, I think, has a moral dimension. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, dissected uh, cows are not going to be great art we'll be looking at in 100 years. There always is is a moral demand. That's why The Godfather is such a great movie. Weirdly enough, though it's based on a criminal syndicate, it really, the way the story is told, which I don't happen to think is true, but it's a very, you know, th there is a morality of the movie and book The Godfather as opposed to the ac reality of, of a criminal syndicate. Um, w without the, the moral underpinnings of a story, or a movie, what is it? It's nothing. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nikki Gray. I'm also a National Journalism Center intern. Fantastic. And you kind of just answered my question. I was gonna say, what are we supposed to do? Because you told us everything <laughs> we're not supposed to do. So on the fly, what is the most surprising fact that you learned while researching your many books? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, it was probably not the most surprising fact, but I, I, I can correct an error now. Everyone thinks, and I thought, I used it in a column some years ago, that it was Talleyrand who said it was worse than a crime, it was a blunder. In fact, that was Joseph Fouché. Um, I didn't realize exactly how pernicious the Democrats had been on civil rights and how fantastic Republicans had been. I knew we were pretty good, but read the civil rights chapter of my book, it'll knock your socks off. Um, I, had, I, I suspected this, although only recently, my admiration for Thurgood Marshall as a young lawyer, which if you haven't read my book yet, he's one of the heroes of the book, um, because as a young lawyer, he was redeeming civil rights the way you're supposed to in a country based on law. He was bringing civil rights lawsuits, making legitimate constitutional arguments, winning them before the Supreme Court. And as long as a, a Republican was in the White House, those, those victories were being enforced by President Eisenhower. He sent the 101st Airborne to Little Rock, Arkansas to march little black children to school. But unfortunately, Nixon lost the 1960 election, or had it stolen. Um, thank you, <laughs> thank you, um, Mayor Daley. Um, and once the Democrats came in, then we get eight years of JFK and LBJ, and they refused to enforce the civil rights laws. That's what gave rise to the civil rights movement. That's why Martin Luther King is not the hero of my book, though I do uh, compare the civil rights movement to Operation Rescue Today. In both cases, they're good causes, and de liberals are preventing us from from being able to exercise what you are supposed to do in a constitutional republic and change the law and win. You can't win on abortion because the Supreme Court hallucinated Roe v. Wade. You, Thurgood Marshall couldn't have his Supreme Court rulings enforced because there were Democrats in the White House and they refused to do it because they didn't want to upset their segregationist base. So those are three things right there. Thank you. Hi, Anne. Thanks for your speech today. Uh, my name is Maggie Walsh from Rowan University in New Jersey and Claire Boothloos intern this summer. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what advice you would give to the Republican who maybe right now is thinking about running against um, Gabrielle Giffords. Ha! That's a good one. <laughs> uh, I wonder what Arizona will do. She'll probably win. She'll probably win on it. That, that tends to be what happens. Um, I don't know, I'd probably take it as a trial run and plan on running in two years because that also usually happens. You get one election on sympathy and the next one you usually lose. Okay, thank you. 
Hi, I'm Heather Isringhausen from um, College of the Ozarks, and I'm also an NJC intern. Oh, great. And my question is, what role religion can play in the media while right now there's an overwhelming um, problem with anti-Christian views in mainstream media? Yes, no, Christianity is now banned, whereas the re religion of liberalism is mandatory. <laughs> that will be taught in the state schools. Um, well, I mean, that's probably part of the reason the, the mainstream media is, is getting smaller and smaller, all these newspapers. I mean, what's weird about it is there, there actually is more competition in the media now, and yet they act like it's still a monopoly. They just want to pull the power, the plug on Fox News. That's their solution. Not imitate Fox News, not get our ratings up too, no, just, just somehow put Fox News out of business. And I mean, you certainly see the same thing with newspapers, which are dying, dying on the vine, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I couldn't be happier about that. So you're gonna see a lot more, more internet journalism. It really is strange and parochial how the media all come out of New York. They have absolutely no concept what their fellow Americans are like and consider the entire South an English-speaking Saudi Arabia. And how can I be a Christian in the media without being blacklisted, pretty much? Oh. You'll probably be blacklisted. Do you know the most under... <laughs> The most underrepresented group among college faculty, big study was done on this a few years ago, never published, but I know the law professor um, who did it, most underrepresented group, Christian women. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for coming to speak with us today. Um, my name's Adam Sylvain, I go to George Mason, and I'm another of the NJC group here today. Um, I was curious, given your legal background, what you, if you had a reaction, um, I had a pretty strong reaction to the public and mainstream media's handling of the Casey Anthony trial and the, the verdict that they came to. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Um, every time I heard that name, I dove for the remote control to change the channel. Okay. Uh, and I realized <laughs> over the weekend, right before the verdict came in, um, I can't work out without watching TV. I was in the gym, every channel, the Disney channel was on doing Casey Anthony. And I realized I'm watching cartoons rather than watch this white trash girl's trial. Um, and the only reaction I had, well, I wrote a column afterwards um, pointing out what you know, terrific mothers, single mothers turn out to be. Um, and also proposing my white trash fee. You know, we, we're not rolling in money now. We're looking for new, what do they call it? Revenue streams. So I want a fee on all of the white trash behavior that costs taxpayers so much money. Um, as the police are combing through the woods looking for this child Casey Anthony had killed and put in the woods, you know, how many people got mugged or had their homes broken into because the police couldn't be doing their actual job? If you talk to any policeman in, in a town, they'll say, we keep going to the same trailer homes for the domestic violence cases. All these, these car chases you see on TV all the time. This is expensive. If you're going to be an idiot, and I think the same thing for people who go, you know, go skiing in avalanches, and we have to spend all of this public money to go rescue them. If you are going to be an idiot, and yes, it is somewhat more prevalent among our white trash brethren. <laughs> no, there's got to be a fee. And if you can't pay it, we'll go, you'll go to debtor's prison. And then at least you won't cause any more trouble. Thank you. Fine idea. It'll be one of the first things I do when I'm appointed president. <laughs> uh, my name is Brendan Pringle. I'm uh, president of the Cal Poly College Republicans in San Luis Obispo. And uh, coming from a family with six kids and uh, my oldest sister being a teacher in the state of California, uh, my question Ooh, is... Ooh, she's loaded. Oh, I know. <laughs> um, my question is, uh, what do you think is the first step in reforming the uh, public school system in the state of California? Well, all of you, instead of going to law school, becoming public school teachers is going to be a big step in the right direction. They won't want to pay public school teachers so much once, <laughs> once we get all the young yappers there. <laughs> um, I, I just, I mean, other than ha having all of you who don't want to go to Hollywood or the media become public school teachers, it has to be destroyed, and it is being destroyed, as with the media. Everything liberals, i.e. the government, gets its hands on, 
ends up being destroyed from the inside. Now, now more people get their, their news from the internet than from their local newspapers. Homeschooling is going through the roof. Oh, and your teacher, by the way, is now going to have to teach um, history with special regard to the contributions of gays, lesbians, and transgendered individuals. That was a law that was recently passed in California. You think I'm joking. I am not joking. And as someone who reads a lot of history, oh, oh, only liberals could make it boring. Only, it's like, it's like it's been rewritten by a German computer. <laughs> and actual history is really interesting, but it was Paul Revere who did the run. It wasn't Mrs. Paul Revere. And to be lying about history and having, you know, a whole chapter on Betty Crocker, because we need the accomplishments of women in the book, no, you're just making history. A, it's not true, and B, it's boring. And, and finally, if I find out that gold was discovered in California by um, a transgender lesbian, I am suing every school I went to for depriving me of laughter. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to go to the book signing. Thank you. Um, Foundation Program Officer Ron Meyer has a couple announcements right now. 